Today's sermon is entitled, What Must I Do to Be Saved? The passages that I've chosen is John chapter 3, verses 14 to 15, Numbers 21, 4 to 9. My name is Reverend Derek Geller. I'm senior pastor here at McKeith Mills Baptist Church. I want to say thank you for attending this session today. I also want to say, blessed be the name of the Lord, for this is a beautiful and a wonderful day. Every day that we get from the Lord is amazing. I got thinking about salvation. You know what? The reality is that salvation is something that is not necessarily always understood very well. This sermon that I'm going to talk about, if you're not saved, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, please listen. Please listen very intently because contained within this sermon will be the way, the truth, and the life. The way to come to know Jesus Christ, how to bow before him, how to make him the Lord of your life, how to become born again. Now, I know some of these terms, if you're listening to it, might be a little bit strange and awkward to you. But I'm going to tell you about a character named Nicodemus, who these terms were also awkward to him too as well. And I'm going to tell you a wonderful story from the Old Testament that hopefully will help clear up the path of salvation. Now, if you are already saved, and I hope many of you are, and uh, as a result of that, I hope you won't turn off the tape. The reality is, is that salvation is important for us as Christians to know and to understand so that we might share it with the world. I think the hardest people above all to share salvation story with are those who are inside of the church. Not everybody in the church, unfortunately, are saved. There are many people that are not saved within the church that merely come to church and they read their Bible and they pray and they go through all the motions. But like the Pharisees of the Old Testament, they're actually not giving their heart to Jesus. They never did that. They never became born again. Those are the people, I'm going to tell you, if you're already saved, those people are hard to talk to. Those people are hard to evangelize, to tell them about Christ. And one of the goals of this sermon is to learn how to tell somebody who thinks they already are saved, but actually aren't, the path to salvation. Okay, imagine just for a moment what courage it must have taken for a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a member of the ruling council. He was fairly well to do, that was for sure. But his, his council, the part, the, the group that he was part of, these Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, they were very antagonistic towards Christ. One day Nicodemus comes out, and it's at night time when he wouldn't be noticed too much in public. And he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Can you imagine the courage Nicodemus had to make those statements? None of those statements, of course, that his group, the Pharisees, would have liked at all. Knowing that Nicodemus' contemporaries believed that all Jews would enter the kingdom of God through the resurrection on the last day, the only exception being those who denied the faith or committed acts of apostasy, Jesus boldly and in contradiction to their beliefs said, Very truly, I tell you, nobody is going to enter into the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus asked Jesus, how can this be possible? Surely one cannot enter their mother's womb a second time. How can this be? You can, all, you can almost understand Nicodemus' confusion. He's saying, I know that nobody gets born again. No animal, no human being gets born twice. No, they get born once and they die once. But they never get born twice. So how is it possible, Jesus, that I could enter my mother's womb and be born again the second time? That's an impossibility. Jesus told him, it was not flesh, ultimately, that he was talking about. He said, by the Spirit of God, who in whatever manner he pleases, ultimately a new birth occurs through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's this point that Nicodemus presses Jesus for a deeper, a much higher understanding or explanation of this new birth. But since he had a regenerate heart, instead of Jesus talking to him in abstract terms that the spiritually blind and deaf cannot understand, Jesus pointed Nicodemus to a story. Moses lifting up a snake on a pole in the Old Testament. And he said, I want you to explain to you, Nicodemus, what salvation is by telling you a story that you understand. Now, we can know a little bit about the Pharisees to know why Jesus did this. He knew and understood that even though this, this teacher or this ruler of the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee who knew and understand God's word very well, he knew he didn't understand the new birth, and he would not understand it unless he could use a reference point, something that Nicodemus did understand and knew very well, and then compare what he was talking about, Jesus, when he said new birth, to something, this one thing that Nicodemus understood in the Old Testament. And he said, I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you the story 
of Moses. And there is a story in the Old Testament, it's found in Numbers chapter number 21, verses 4 to 9, where Moses lifted up a bronze snake, and the children of Israel, because of that, got to live. Now, let me tell you a little bit about that story. And I can only imagine as Jesus was telling the story, Nicodemus, of course, would have been paying attention very intently. He would have said, okay, you told me about the new birth. I didn't understand it. Now you're going to tell me a story I do understand and draw a comparison. So Nicodemus is listening to him very intently at this point. After the Lord had given Israel victory over the Canaanite king of Arad, we are told that to keep them from going into the Edomite territory, which they weren't allowed to go in there because Edom wouldn't allow them in their territory, the children of Israel went a different route. And we are told that they went through the eastern desert area of Mount Hor. Now, this is important to know because this particular area, and of course, as soon as I say desert, you think hostile, and rightly so, was incredibly hostile. It was deemed in their time the most inhospitable territory on all of the earth. That's how bad it was. So they're routed away from an easy path through Edomite territory because the Edomites didn't want them to go through that territory. And they have to go through this other spot, this desert, that's incredibly hostile. So you can imagine the children of Israel are not happy. During this incredibly difficult journey, the people, Israel, started to speak against God and Moses saying, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread. There's no bread here. There's nothing here that we want. There's no water. And we detest this miserable food that you've given us. Due to their disparaging comment on the bread from heaven being absolutely worthless and an overall lack of faith and trust in God, the Lord sent venomous, fiery snakes amongst them, and they bit the people, and many of the Israelite people died. As they had done in the past, when they were punished, Israel went to Moses and said, Would you intercede on our behalf? In other words, would you go to God and pray for us for forgiveness because we know we've done wrong? We now realize that grumbling against God is not what he wants. We have learned that lesson in the past, of course, but we've unfortunately forgotten it. Now, Moses, would you go plead to God because we're all dying. These fiery snakes are jumping up and they're biting us. And as soon as they do, we're dying from this. So we need your help. We need God to appease his wrath and, and stop this, this plague. When Moses prayed to God, the remedy God gave him was, ironically, to make a bronze snake and to put it on a pole, and then anybody who looked at that bronze snake got to live. They were instantly cured from the poison. In other words, a poison within their body automatically left or became mute. God didn't remove the snakes, so, and this is very important to get in the story, he didn't remove the snakes, and people still got bit, but anybody who looked upon the bronze snake always got to live immediately, they got healed. Okay, that's the story that Jesus wanted to tell Nicodemus about. And here's why he told him about it. He said, in the same manner that this bronze snake was lifted up and everybody got salvation, Christ would be lifted up upon a cross and you would get salvation from Christ. I'm going to explain what that means a little bit more in a moment. But let's go a little bit further here. The fiery snakes. I want to talk about them because really to understand this story from Nicodemus's perspective, we've got to understand how deadly these snakes were. We've got to understand that. The first thing we learn in this story, ultimately, that sin leads to death. Israel sinned against God because they found his way in their life to be detestable and worthless. Lest, in hindsight, we think less of Israel and elevate our own generation too much, we must remember that ever since Adam, God has given us over to reprobate minds, Romans 8.28, because we crave the things of this world. We're in love with the things that give us pleasure from this world rather than being in love with God. Since Israel considered snakes unclean and they actually personified sin, God rightly sent fiery snakes to punish them, to show them their sin, to bring their sin out into the open. The poison of these venomous snakes was excruciatingly painful, for once it entered the blood, it became like a boiling river, swollen with anguish, and it was always, without exception, lethal. In other words, if you got bitten by one of these snakes, you always died unless you took on the remedy. Despite knowing that faithful obedience to God led to his approval, his blessings, his avoidance of punishments, Israel still preferred self or pleasure of self to be their own God. 
In a similar manner, if we forsake the Lord in spirit or in doctrine, temptation will lure us onto a path of destruction. Sin leads to death. Sin will sting our feet. While the sting of sin may be temporary, Carnal pleasures do not, uh, might be temporary, and carnal pleasures are one of those things that you look at and say, you know what, has that really got anything bad or is that really wrong? The reality that it really is. Don't be fooled. The wages of sin is always death. It's always the bite of a serpent that's going to lead ultimately to a fiery death of everlasting punishment cast into hell where there will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Always. So, right off the bat, Jesus is drawing the parallel. He's saying, in the Old Testament, because people sinned against God, these fiery snakes bit them, and then they always, if they didn't take on God's remedy, they always in pain and anguish died. In the same manner, Jesus is saying, in this day and age, if you don't look upon the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you sin, which all people do, then you're going to be bit by that sin, and you will die without God's help. Same idea. The cure for this disease being bit by the fiery snake in the old testament or bit by sin in the new ultimately is god's remedy and you must grab a hold of it that's the parallel that jesus was drawing through to nicodemus and to us today despite knowing such a fate awaits the defiant self-pleasing person like israel many will live their lives with carnal pleasures of lust in their eyes knowing full well that this unquenchable and eternal pain and anguish is going to be their reward in other words, Nicodemus was very aware of this, and we should be today too, that many people will not take on the cure that God gives them. They will choose to continue to live their lives the way they want to, and as a result of that, they will choose to eternally die. That's their choice. It's a choice they must make. A choice that we all must make in life. We either decide to accept God and live eternally in His presence and with all of His blessings, or we decide to reject Him. And if we do, we end up dying. Okay, let's go on to the next part here. And I think this is really important here. Not by works. And this is really important here. And this is where I'm getting back to the church situation again. Okay, we do have people inside of the church, unfortunately, that are not saved. We have some people inside of the church that they read their Bible. Yes, they pray. Yes, they spend time feeding the poor. Yes, they give money unto God. Absolutely. But there are people inside of the church today who are not saved and don't believe in Jesus at all. They never gave their hearts over to him. And we have some people like that. There is no cure for the fatal disease called sin. There are no healing salves, no brewing potions, no medicine, no human doctor that could cure Israel from the fiery snake bites. Likewise, there's no human cure for sin today because Christianity is not a works religion. For those people inside the church that think, I can pray my way into heaven, no, you cannot. I can read my Bible and get all my way into heaven, no, you cannot. I can sing the songs inside of the church and make it to heaven, no, you can't do that either. You must make a decision for Jesus or you can't make it there. Nicodemus could not find a cure for his separation from God within the Pharisaic teachings and traditions because salvation, or the seal of the Holy Spirit, cannot be purchased by anybody. I remember the story in the New Testament about Simon. And Simon came forward and he said to the apostles, he said, I want to buy the Holy Spirit. I see all these miracles you're doing, and I want to have the power of the Holy Spirit so that I can sell these miracles to the world. And, of course, the apostle says, oh, my goodness, how offensive to God. You cannot buy his salvation. Definitely not. You must surrender your life and obtain it freely through the grace of God himself. You can go to church. You can read your Bible. You can take the Lord's Supper. You can be baptized. You can go through severe penances. You can give all your goods to the poor. You can pray without ceasing. You can pray for yourself. You can pray for others. You can attempt to fulfill every single law God has ever given to us. And the licks of hell will consume your filthy rags in a moment and a twinkling of an eye when you die. And you will still go to hell. Why? Because you don't know Jesus. The relationship with Jesus is absolutely paramount. Those who are like the Pharisees and trust their attempt to outwardly obey God through religion will forever be seekers, but never finders of his cure, 2 Timothy 3.7. 
like the Israelites, who were not told to buy some relic of the bronze serpent that Moses impaled upon a pole. We too today should not buy golden crosses or, or anything that represents God, a graven image. That's not the point, really. The point is, is that we're supposed to bow our knee to Jesus, not buy trinkets and toys that rep- merely represent him, but don't actually represent him at all. I got thinking, this is a human disease, sin. There is no human cure. There's only a heavenly one. Like Israel, the only cure for the self-induced fatal wound of sin must come from a sacrifice and atonement that he alone and only he can ultimately provide. Okay? Now, let's talk about salvation. And this is really important. Now, again, if you're a non-believer, please, please pay attention. Please listen to what I'm about to say. It all comes from God's word, not from me. And it is the way that you can become saved. If you are already saved, please listen as well, because I'm going to explain from God's word how people become saved. And I want you to grab a hold of that story and tell it to the world. I'm going to talk about that a little later. But how does salvation happen? The only cure for death is life in Christ, though it seems absolutely absurd. And I think it did. A form of mockery, maybe even possibly despised. In Israel, the curse that they had was these fiery snakes. And they kept flying up and biting them on the legs and biting them on the arms. And as soon as that happened, they would be poisoned. And in the end, they would die. Well, here's the thing. When we get bit by sin, the same thing happens. We're going to be poisoned by sin. And if we don't seek God's cure, we're going to die. The cure now, listen to this. This is a little bit absurd if you think about it in human terms only. God in his infinite wisdom told the Israelite people, I'm going to get Moses to make a bronze snake. And if you look upon this snake, you will live. Can you imagine what they must have been thinking? Oh my goodness, the very snake, uh, an emblem of the very snake that bit us is going to cure us. I got to think, oh my goodness, they must have thought that was crazy. But the reality is the same is true of the way the world thinks about Christ. Christ, it says in scriptures, became sin. He did not sin. No, he didn't at all. But at the same time, he became a curse. He hung upon a tree. He took on the sins of the entire world. Not that he sinned any, but he took them on the punishment of them. The wrath of God for every sin that was ever done. Hung on that cross, paid the price for every sin that ever happened, ever and said, there, God's wrath is appeased. Anybody who believes in me will live. What a beautiful story. Oh my goodness, this is important. Though their speech might fail them, their pulse grow weak in death, but be a heart beat away. All who look upon the bronze servant of Israel uh, will live. They live. They, anyone who did. The same is true of Christ. Anyone who looks upon, and when I say looks upon, I mean believes in the atonement of Christ, the fact that he paid the price for our sins, lives. It's belief. It's faith in Christ. It's not works. It's faith in Christ that actually gets a person saved. To the outward eye, the death of a supposed criminal and and one who hung upon a tree, which was considered cursed by the Jewish people, I think it might have seemed absurd, and it probably ultimately did. It might seem ultimately foolish for us to believe in such an individual that would end up on a cross. But in the end, this is how we do get saved, because Christ chose to be humiliated, chose to let us execute him. Why? Because he had to pay the price for our sins. He had to. Also, like the bronze snake, no matter how deeply poisoned we are, no matter how far we are gone, no matter how old we are, no matter how close we are to death, the moment Israel looked upon the bronze snake, they were instantly cured. The moment we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter how little time we have in life or how much we have sinned or gravely we have sinned, we still get saved because the blood of Christ covers any and all sins, all of them. So if you're thinking, and a lot of people do, by the way, out in this world think, you know what, I've sinned really bad. And if I listen to all my sins, you'd be grossed out. You wouldn't want to be my friend anymore. You wouldn't even hang around me anymore because I've done a lot of sinning. You know what? God knows all of your sins. Jesus knew every sin you ever did or will ever do. And yet he died for you. He died for his enemies, it says in scriptures. He died for you. He died for me. And none of us earn our salvation. 
All of us only get to be saved because of Jesus Christ's free gift and through faith in Him. So salvation, it wasn't for good or religious people like the Pharisees who tried to save themselves through works. No, out of the wisdom of God, it's a free gift that anyone can open. Anyone can have faith in Christ and live. But here's the thing. It's a decision and everybody makes it. You either open the gift and say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I have faith in him and I want to make him the Lord of my life. And you become saved, a born again, a brand new creation in Christ. Or you choose to ignore that decision and you actually make the decision. I reject him. I reject his free gift. I don't want it. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to open it. No, I'm not interested. I want to live my life the way I want to. That's rejecting Christ. Salvation is by far, by far the greatest decision you will ever make in your life. And everybody makes that decision, either to say yes or to say no. I hope and pray you're one of the people that has actually said yes. And if you haven't, All you got to do is have faith. All you got to do is believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again. All you have to do is ask him into your heart. All you have to do is say, Jesus, please be the Lord of my life. And you will be saved this very moment. That is awesome. And I hope and pray if you're not saved, you say that. Okay, let's take a look here just for a moment. We've got to accept this gift. We must accept it. I want to go back to this. I really want to, to bring this point alive. Nicodemus had a question. He said, how must I be saved? There is no self-help book, no physician, no healing bomb, no medicine, no religious ritual, no intercessory prayer that can lead to buying your salvation. Just because you're a good person doesn't mean you get to go to heaven. No. Just because you could do good deeds or you happen to be out there feeding the poor or you happen to be out there, you know, helping one another, that doesn't mean that you're going to go to heaven. No. The only way that you can get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Ultimately, we've got to understand the wages of sin is death. But we can be born of the water and spirit. But we must have faith that Christ paid the price for our sins. Despite how deeply entrenched or close to death an Israelite had, as soon as they looked upon the serpent they lived, the same is true of you and me. If you're not saved today, the second you pray the sinner's prayer and say, Lord, come into my heart, you are saved. Likewise, even if you have the stoniest of black hearts, like King Manasseh had. I got thinking about him. He's from the Old Testament. He was one of Israel's kings, and he was detestable. Oh, my goodness, he was bad. I mean, really bad. And I encourage you to go into uh, Second Chronicles around chapter number 33 and read about him. He did some really bad things. He went against God in every way, shape, and form. He was defiant. He had many gods. God told him very clearly, Israel, you can only have one God, me. That's it. Nobody else. If you have any other gods, then I'm going to be angry and bitter with you. And, you know, this fella, he has Manasseh. He has many gods to make matters even worse. He actually offered some of his children to, to other gods, sacrifice them. That was definitely not allowed in the Bible. You are never to offer human sacrifice anywhere at any time. And, and Manasseh did it anyway. Manasseh actually practiced witchcraft. Can you imagine praying to the devil? He did that too. He did a whole bunch of things that God had told him, this is going to make me angry. This is going to make me bitter towards you. Don't do these things. And he did them all. Now, Manasseh actually got punished by God. But if you read in Chronicles, you're going to find out Manasseh actually got on his hands and knees in a prison and looked up to God and he couldn't really see anything. But he said, Lord God, oh my God, Goodness, I've been wrong. Forgive me, Lord. I've sinned against you so very much. Please, Lord, accept me. And here's the wonderful part. If you read Chronicles, God did. God did. God saved Manasseh. In the same way, we may have a black stony heart, which all of us did when we, before we got saved. We may not think much about God at all. We might not be living our lives for him. We might not be praying. We not, might not be reading our Bible. But you know what? Those are outward sides. But inside of us, which really counts the most, we may not love him at all. We may actually detest him. This is how we start out. But the moment we say, Lord, forgive me, come into my heart, make me whole again. I want to be born again. You are the Lord of my life. Lord, come in and take over. 
I love you so very much. Teach me. Teach me how to love you. The moment that happens, we become born again. We become a child of God and we are sealed. This is the wonderful part. Sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. You know what? Jesus told Nicodemus, if you want the Holy Spirit to live inside of you, if you want to be born again, if you want to be sealed by God's very own Spirit, guaranteeing you that you're going to go to heaven, then you must be born again, which means you must have faith in Jesus Christ. Never forget the sanctification leads to needs a lifetime to occur. That means becoming closer to God. But justification is already done through Christ. And the moment that we say yes to Jesus, that very moment we're justified to be called children of God. Sadly, many will reject God's gracious gift of salvation. And like the Israelites, will not find any way to appease God's wrath because they won't accept his remedy. So, on Christ's behalf, I implore you. You may be the vilest wretch on this earth. You might be drowning. You might be entrenched and choking in your own lust and your own sins. You might ultimately have many gods that have enslaved you. But if you repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then he will heal you. He will cleanse you of all your sins. He will take them all away and make them as white as snow. He will send God's Spirit to live inside of you. You will be born again and you will be a child of God, sealed forever to live with Him for an eternity. This is the only way salvation occurs. And it is glorious and beautiful. Now, I want to go back to the very first part of the sermon. I was talking to a whole bunch of you that are already saved. And I assume that are many of you that are on this tape right now listening are saved. Now, here's the challenge for you. And I think it's a really big one. Go and tell the world all about Christ. Go, therefore, and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and tell the world about Jesus. The goal of this sermon is not just for you who are not saved to find out what is the path of salvation and become saved. That's a really big goal, by the way, and that's my primary goal. But the secondary goal of this sermon is to spur all of you on who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to go out and tell the world, the world about him. May God loosen your fearful hearts. And I know it's very scary to go out into this world and tell this world about Jesus, especially considering the fact that a lot of them are very hostile towards God. May God loosen your stammering tongues. May you get out there and tell the whole world about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may the light that shines within you, God's holy word, the spirit of God, his presence, may that shine. May he shine to the world. And may they know you are Christians by your love. And while there may be many of those out there whose hearts are really as stony as Pharaoh and are never going to change, there are also many out there, I believe, who already have the seeds of righteousness planted within their hearts, and they're just waiting for somebody like you and me to go out there and tell them, to water those seeds. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them the story. Tell them the story. Jesus took the time to tell Nicodemus the story. He told him a story that he'd understand. He did that so Nicodemus might have a chance to understand God's gracious gift of salvation. May we take the same time to go out in the world and tell them, everyone that we meet about Christ too as well. Surely those who have the mind of Christ and are his ambassadors can take the time to raise the gospel message up very high to a world that has been poisoned by sin. They're heading for an eternity of hell of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Surely out of compassion, out of the goodness of our hearts, for the fact that God tells us to do it, surely we go out there and tell the world, I have a cure. I don't have it myself, but I know of the cure for the disease that you have that's killing you, sin, and that's Jesus. Let us remember that the depths of depravity which we ourselves were once in, and let us rejoice. Let us give thanksgiving to God. Let's go out there with boldness. Let's raise God's banner of love to the lost of this world with a profound message. God hasn't forgotten them. God loves them. And he's always got his hand out. And he's always saying, look, I want to save you from where you're at. But you've got to have faith in my son, Jesus Christ. You've got to believe in his atoning sacrifice. You've got to say yes. I want you to be the Lord of my life. And the moment that you do, I'll accept you as one of my children in my kingdom. We've got to get out and tell the world about this because this is radical. 
God's going to take the dust, and that's what we're called in the scripture, by the way, the dust of this earth or the worms of this earth, and he's going to radically transform them into his image, back into his image. He's going to restore that glorious image in which he created us, a likeness of him. And this is what we've got to do as believers. Tell the world. This is important. You know what? There's nothing else that you can do in life, I think, that's more important than sharing the gospel message with the world. So I challenge you, all you Christians that are out there, tell the world about Jesus always. In 1 Peter, it says, always be ready to have the reasons ready, ready to go. The reasons why you have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the moment that somebody like a Nicodemus comes forward and says, what must I do to be saved? Be ready. Be ready to tell them with great conviction. You know what? If you are not saved and you still don't understand the path of salvation, you know what? Please contact me. You can go on the website. You can find my email there. I would dearly love to share the salvation story in more depth with you because I really want to see as many people that I know in life to become saved as possible because you are dearly, dearly loved. May God bless you today. Amen and amen.